So good morning. Today we are going to be having a discussion on uh, fluid transfer equipment. We're going to be taking a look at piping, valves, and pumps today with some discussion on characteristics as well as some calculations associated with identifying process parameters for operation. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and begin our discussion. So, so this is going to be chapter eight within the text, which, hold on, my words seem to be tangled. Oh, why is that red? A little early for a red pen. All right, so let's start our discussion with a comparison between pipes and tubes or piping and tubing. So in general, pipes are considered thick walled with large diameters. Of moderate length. Used to transport large volumes of fluid. Relatively speaking, they typically exist as various materials of construction. The most common things that you'll see is things like carbon steel, stainless steel, and sometimes you can get into nickel alloys depending on the characteristics of the material that you're interested in. These pipes can be threaded. And in general, as they're a lot of times made of metals, there's going to be a reasonable surface roughness involved, which we've already kind of discussed briefly. Now, to contrast that with tubes and tubing, tubes are often considered thin walled with small diameters and the lengths exist in, in typically in terms of coils. That exists with smooth walls. And these are gonna be situations when you're, you're wanting to transport smaller or small volumes of fluid. In terms of materials of construction, the most common thing you'll see here are going to be plastics. And in general, when we're looking at tubing, we're looking at systems where we want to protect fluid from contamination and high shear. This is where you're going to see a lot of biological fluids involved, which require tubing. And, and from this, um, you know, there are tubing that exists that can be typically can be sterilized more easily than piping. 
And so th hopefully that kind of gives you an idea in terms of the differences that we consider between pipes and tubing. Tubing is for your more smaller scale, you know, bench top type fluid transfer systems. This is going to exist mainly in the medical field when you want to really uh, reduce any sort of contamination in the, the fluids, particularly biological fluids. And piping is more your, you know, commercial industrial type systems where you're going to be looking at large volumes of fluid tra for transfer. And so you're going to be considering things that, that can handle that and that where the fluid essentially won't damage uh, the piping. So that's when you're going to consider what's the proper material of construction so the fluid doesn't damage the piping versus the con consideration for tubing where the tubing won't damage the fluid. Some other things to consider is in selecting a proper pipe slash tube diameter. And so when we're talking, we're looking at turbulent flow. We find that capital costs of pipes and tubing fall in proportion with diameter to the 1.5 power. However, the operating costs end up being proportional. That was a weird D with the diameter to the negative 4.8. That means increasing our diameter increases our expected capital costs, but it also reduces our operating costs because the fluid for a given flow rate will flow at a lower velocity, and thus it will lose less energy through frictional dissipation. This implies that an optimal Pipe diameter and flow velocity exists. Which can be calculated or approximated by the following equation where the optimal flow velocity is equal to 12 times the mass flow rate to the point 0.1 power divided by the density of your fluid to the point 0.36 power. That means that if we're interested in solving for an optimal pipe diameter and knowing that Our mass flow rate is equal to density times velocity. In this case, it would be our optimal velocity times area, which is equal to density times our velocity times pi d squared over 4. We can solve for an optimal diameter as the square root of 4 times our mass flow rate divided by our fluid density and our optimal velocity and pi. Any questions so far? Are you guys following along OK? Am I going too fast, or is this a good pace for you all? Less, no, thumbs up, thumbs down. I think it's good. All right. Thank you for the feedback. So in terms of situations where you really don't want to calculate these types of things, you can rely on some rules of thumb. Uh, 
which state for incompressible fluids. The optimal velocity will typically be between three and six feet per second. And for compressible fluids, the optimal velocity will be higher on the order of 20 to 80 feet per second. One thing to keep in mind, however, is that the optimal velocity will be higher in heat exchangers due to the improvements and heat transfer at high flow velocities. All right, so the next thing we can discuss are valves, valves and fluid transfer systems. So the first question I always like to ask is what is the primary purpose of fluid valves. What are your thoughts? Would it be to like regulate the flow of fluid? Yeah, so to regulate. Fluid flow. Follow-up question, therefore, is how does a valve regulate fluid flow? What are your ideas? maybe through mechanical energy or compression? Yes and no. When we consider a valve and how it exists, I guess the question that I should answer is, where does valves exist within our mechanical energy balance? our big delta P over rho, blah, blah, blah equation. Where do we put valves in when we have valves in a system? When we want to look at an energy balance for fluid flow. Is it in the U squared over two portion? It is not. It exists within our friction of a uh, expression, which means valves regulate flow by manipulation of frictional dissipation or easier said head loss 
within our system. Now, there's a number of ways in which valves exist and operate. If you consider a very simple form, let's say I have a valve that simply looks like this. And this valve can move in and out of the flow path. What it's essentially doing is creating a point of flow restriction, which depending on the severity of that flow restriction, creates a zone of contraction and expansion. And in each of these zones, we're gonna have eddies, vortices, and therefore frictional dissipation. And so the extent of energy loss is directly related to the valve position. within the fluid flow system. Right, so if it's completely out of the flow path or if it looks a little like this, we can expect very little energy loss, right? The zone's only gonna happen in these areas versus the valve position up above that has greater obstruction of flow. And by manipulating this energy that exists within the fluid system, we can also manipulate the fluid flow rate, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. And so this allows us for, let's say, now we're going to look at a process operation condition, or let's say I've got a feed to a reactor. It's a reactor. And let's say I've got, I don't know, ethyl benzene. Seems to be a popular thing in the design systems. So if I've got a feed flow rate, of this reagent or chemical reagent for our reaction process, I can regulate the flow in a couple of ways. One of the easiest ways is through design and operation of control systems. So I can have a ses and sensor here, let's say it's a flow sensor This flow sensor trans transmit a signal to a flow controller, which you'll talk about them a little bit more. And that flow controller can then transmit another signal to the actual valve. And this communication creates a loop that allows this valve to control the flow entering the reactor by means of a sensor and a controller. And so an important thing to note is valves almost always require control systems to properly regulate flow. Now you can 
they can happen manually. You can have manual valve systems. However, that's going to be subject to a lot of user error. It's much better to design uh, computer systems that can take signals and interpret them and control your 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 process for you. And you know, to be continued and process control. Sorry, it keeps jumping. There's a lot here to unpack. We're not going to get into it. However, there is some very powerful stuff at play when it comes to valves and how they regulate flow. So to recap, the primary principle on which a valve can regulate flow is through manipulation of frictional dissipation, where the valve position is directly tied to the energy loss that is experienced by the fluid within the flow system. And this allows valves and proper valve positions to regulate flows primarily through the use of control systems. And there's, there's a whole lot of things that can exist within valves. Another thing that's often used, which I think it's important to kind of talk about because we're going to get into it in a second, is known as check valves, or these are also called one-way valves. So a check valve is a flow control system that regulates flow precisely by ensuring flow only occurs in one direction. So you're going to use these when you absolutely do not want any sort of backflow potential to exist within your system. One of the easiest ways to do this is through one of several ones, but for example, I can show you one that we're going to look at more so here in a second, is known as a ball valve. So let's see, I've got a ball here. And the way this ball valve works, is if fluid is flowing in this direction, it exerts a force that lifts the ball up, which allows the fluid to continue flowing in your flow system. However, if you look at the opposite condition, now we're looking at the same ball, and the flow essentially is attempting to reverse itself, this, what it results, is it increases the compression of the ball valve on that seal that exists within the flow system. And so what that means is flow can only occur in the desired direction. So it's an important thing to consider in terms of certain valves and how they operate. And that there's a lot of different ways in which valves can exist and operate. Your synthesis assignment's gonna be a little uh, focused on exploring valves in a little more detail. But is there any questions in kind of the primary design and function of valves within flow systems? Clear as mud. I have a question. Go for it. On the last picture you just drew, are you saying that's a check ball valve or is yes. it just a ball valve? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, it's a check valve. I know I didn't draw it the best. There's a there's better pictures on page two hundred and two hundred one on some of these valves. All right, for the rest of the day, we're gonna talk about
pumps and pump operation. So in general, there are two types of pumps. There is positive displacement pumps. And there's centrifugal pumps. Now, let's first talk about positive displacement pumps. As there are three types of positive displacement pumps that are typically considered. One is known as a reciprocating pump. A rotary pump. And the last one is a peristaltic. And they all exist on and operate on the principle of applying pressure to a control volume of fluid. And so the best way to, to kind of talk about these pumps in general is to look at some examples that you should see here. So are you guys seeing this um, reciprocating pump? This is an example of a positive displacement pump. And so the way this works is you see this cam moves this piston back and forth. So this piston, I think I can actually draw on this, we'll move this piston back and forth. And when the piston moves backwards, the volume that of fluid that can exist within this pump increases. And what that does is it creates a pressure in two directions. It causes this check valve to move inward and close, and it causes this check valve to move inward and open. What this will do is it will allow fluid and the inlet to fill the piston chamber. Once the piston is essentially reached the pick and we have the maximum control volume, then what will happen is each of these systems will change directions. So now the piston will start moving inward. This will experience a pressure and it will close the inlet valve. And the outlet check valve will open when only a certain condition is met. And what it does, what happens is the fluid within this system, oh, I just lost my place. Why, okay. And essentially this piston will start compressing the fluid within the chamber. And once the pressure has reached a certain set valve, set point, only then will that outlet check valve open and the fluid will flow out. And then the cycle continues. Then the piston will move out, the outlet check valve will close, the inlet check valve will open, more fluid comes in, it reaches the maximum, then the piston starts going back inward, the fluid gets compressed, the inlet closes, and the outlet check valve opens when the fluid pressure reaches a certain set point. And so this reciprocating pump, essentially what you see is a control volume of fluid pressurized 
by a piston. Right, and so you basically have this cam attached to your, your, your motor, it spins and that piston's moving in and out, and it's essentially bringing in fluid, compressing it, releasing it, bringing it fluid, compressing it, releasing it, and it's moving so quickly that the flow, you know, by continuity exists at a steady rate. And we see a, a net increase in the pressure energy of the fluid by the pump. Here, let me clean this up. I should probably do the John Madden uh, a little bit more. I'll work on my impression. So the next the next pump we can talk about is a rotary pump. This is another kind of positive displacement pump. However, you'll notice these rotary impellers spin in these directions. And what, the, what you see is a control volume of fluid being brought in by these rotary impellers. And it gets brought around to the outlet. And at this point, this fluid is compressed through the outlet. Right, because you have two control volumes that are now being pushed and squeezed out as these impeller blades come together. So the fluid is pressurized at the outlet. Then as these impellers come back, you have a suction pressure that brings in more fluid. Yeah. And so that's how a typical rotary pump works. You have suction pressure brings in fluid. The teeth or little power blades bring the fluids around, compresses it at the outlet, then the suction pressure brings more fluid in. And so you have essentially two control volumes of fluid being brought in at one time. The next type of fluid, excuse me, the next type of pump is a positive displacement pump or a peristaltic. These are really good for biological, biomedical systems. Here, I gotta make sure you guys can hear the sound. It's important. By important, I mean it's really not. So you'll notice we have a control volume of fluid here. And these wheels are essentially squeezing and containing those control volumes and pushing it over. This creates a suction pressure at the inlet, which is bringing in fluid. The beauty of peristaltic pumps is that you can get very precise flow rates, very low flow rates in these systems, which is why you see them a lot in biomedical systems when you need very steady, very small flow rates. You'll also notice that this peristaltic pump relies on tubing. And the beauty of this system is the fluid never comes in contact with any of the pump housing. That's another reason why these peristaltic pumps are advantageous when it comes to system where you want to keep your fluid from any sort of contamination. So you can imagine if this was a, you know, a hospital type of operation, if you had some sort of medicine or blood transfusion kind of thing, you could have a sterile tube 
side of centrifugal pumps or positive displacement pumps, excuse me, is a centrifugal pump. This operates uh, at a very different principle than positive displacement. In this system, we don't have a singular control volume. Instead, what we have is a continuous volume of fluid that enters our system through the center of the centrifugal pump through what's known as the suction eye, which applies a suction pressure. This impeller spins as indicated, and this exerts a centrifugal force onto the fluid. This forces the fluid into the outer edges of the pump. And what you'll notice is that energy, as the fluid is being thrown to the outside of the impeller, it imparts a high amount of kinetic energy on your fluid. Then what happens is the fluid then gets moved towards the discharge. And as this fluid moves towards the discharge, you'll notice the diameter of flow is increasing. And so this increasing diameter by continuity will decrease the flow velocity. And what this does is that kinetic energy is transferred as pressure energy, such that you get to the discharge and you've reached your steady state flow velocity and the excess kinetic energy is then transferred as pressure energy to your fluid as it exits the system, which means for the system, you have a certain incoming pressure and then a much higher discharge pressure, all because you're imparting kinetic energy. So high level of kinetic energy. Being added to the fluid. Then, why does that keep happening? By the impeller. Then as it moves through throughout that impeller exterior, the velocity decreases, the pressure energy increases to the where you get your discharge. And that's how the essentially key principles of centrifugal pump operation exists. You bring in your fluid through suction pressure, you impart high kinetic energy through a rotating impeller. Then as the fluid moves through the impeller housing, it gets that kinetic energy gets converted into pressure energy as it is discharged. Are there, does that make sense? Are there any questions or comments that we can consider and discuss? Are you guys kind of getting how it operates? My explanations are, are clear. Yes, no. All right. There's a couple other things that we can consider. Is that in general, positive displacement pumps. Are used for low to moderate volumes of fluid or high precision and low risk for contamination. is critical.
that's the, uh, also the good thing about positive displacement pumps is that you can impart high pressures into a fluid. Things on the order of, you know, 100 to 1,000 PSI can be imparted by uh, the proper design of a positive displacement pump. Now for centrifugal pumps, these are the workhorses of chemical process industry. These are used when dealing with large volumes of fluid. So in instances where there's a, a big issue associated with you, you're trying to get, you know, reasonably large flow rates, trying to move a whole lot of liquid all at one time. All right. Any questions on pumps? All right, let's, the next thing I wanna talk about then is sort of pump operation as it relates to two things. One, cavitation and what's known as net positive suction head. So has anyone heard of any of these two terms as it relates to fluid mechanics? Out of curiosity. Yes, no, maybe so, or no? No. Nope. Okay, I got one no, and a whole lot of black okay, rectangles. Number the seniors probably have from talking about an econ. Yeah, I'm sure David's told you some more stories about his time in Russia, something, something like that. So let's start talking about cavitation. And so to illustrate this principle, let's say I've got a fluid transfer system and I, I don't know, what, what do you guys want to transfer? All right, let's say we got some Dr. Pepper. And I got it, putting it in one of those little person's got this little hat. The little hat's got a straw. Dude's drinking Dr. Pepper at the game. Or number one. Go sports. But the issue that we're find is that For some reason, this person really likes hot Dr. Pepper, and the temperature of the Dr. Pepper is just about its boiling point. So if that fluid, that Dr. Pepper is at its boiling point, what we, can we say regarding the pressure of the fluid as it relates to the vapor pressure? How does the pressure of the fluid at the boiling point. This is a, one of those 307 questions. This is being recorded for purposes that I can talk with Dr. O about. 
No pressure. Pun intended. So what can we say about the pressure as it relates to the vapor pressure? We got some hot Dr. Pepper. Any ideas? With you, you know, it's going to the E power, right? Because we have to take the the E to cancel the LN for Antoine's equation. But if oh, you can use Antoine, but Antoine's just a bunch of bunch of empirical factors, right? There's got to be some type of knowledge in there, right? Some type there of is. Well, what I can say is when when you you've reached that boiling point, the pressure that exists within the fluid is the vapor pressure, right? And so what we can say is we have a saturated fluid, right? And so any decrease in the fluid pressure will result in a phase change. Right, but what happens with that saturated fluid as it enters a pump? Well, to get the fluid into the pump, a suction pressure exists. At the pump inlet, right? Because you have to have a pressure gradient to get fluid to flow, which means you put a, a, a part of your pump where the pressure is less than the pressure of your fluid. Or the pressure of the fluid is greater than the pressure within the inlet of the pump, of pump. This is our suction. That's why we call it a suction pressure. It creates a partial vacuum or a, a pressure lower than the fluid to bring the fluid into the pump. And so, uh-oh, my fluid's already at saturation. And so to bring it in the pump, the pressure falls. And if it's at or near saturation, an issue can arise within my pump, such that if this fluid is at saturation or near it, depending on the type of pump involved, because sometimes such suction pressures can be pretty, pretty high. Within the pump, what happens is instead of having just fluid, I can have vapor start to exist within my pump because I'm lowering that pressure. So I'm, I'm gonna start partially vaporizing my fluid. And so vapor bubbles form. within my pump. And so what I can say is, this is a bad thing. This is called cavitation. And so to simply, you know, put it in lama terms, cavitation is the formation of or vapor within my pump. I shouldn't say my pump, it's not my pump, I didn't buy it. Within a pump or pump housing due to a fluid existing at or near its saturation point. <laughs> 
Yes, I can, Jasmine. You're welcome. All right, so we have essentially Dr. Pepper really close to seven at saturation point or at its saturation point, the suction pressure brings it below the saturation point, which means the fluid starts to vaporize. This creates bubbles within your system and that can cause bad things for your pump. Loud noises, vibrations, and things breaking within the pump, which will sound expensive, which is why it's an issue and it's a bad thing. And so what do we do to avoid cavitation? Well, for a given pump, there exists a value, what is known as a net positive suction head, or NPSH, or a net pressure head that is required by the fluid to avoid cavitation. You know, simply put, if the suction pressure at the inlet's gonna be 10 PSI, there better be at least 10 PSI of available pressure head to avoid the cavitation issue that exists or that can exist. And so we can calculate net positive suction header NPSH by the following expression. One divided by gravity times the pressure initially or at initial point P sub A minus the vapor pressure of your fluid over density <clears throat> minus U squared over two minus the head loss, minus Z sub A, and I'm gonna put an asterisk by this for a reason, which I'll get to in a minute. So this is your NPSH. Keep in mind that this has units of length, right? Because it's in terms of head. So it'll say how many you know, feet of head is needed to avoid the issue of cavitation. And this is something that's going to be identified by a pump manufacturer. For a given pump at a given impeller speed and impeller diameter, it will tell you the minimum NPSH that must be available in the fluid to avoid cavitation. And simply put, don't operate with a fluid where the NPSH A is below NPSH R. And so this calculates what I call NPSHA, or the net positive suction head available by the fluid, of the fluid. This must be compared to the net positive suction head required now I'll say C manufacturer and simply put if NPSH A is greater than NPSH R yay and if NPSH a is less than NPSHR, not so. All right. <clears throat> so a question to consider, going back to my guy with the weird Dr. Pepper invention. 
based on the expression that you see in the system, how can we increase NPSHR, or excuse me, A for my fluid? Looking at this equation. And you know what? I'll, I'll give you guys some breakout time. Go ahead and talk for two, three minutes. See what ideas you can come up with. How to increase the net positive suction head available based off the expression for a fluid and a fluid transfer system. That's sorry. Go oh, there you go, Parker. I didn't realize it didn't give you a room. <clears throat> Very strange. All right, how'd it go? We have some great ideas, Dr. Lopez. All right, I can't wait to hear them. So how do we do it? How can we keep our Dr. Pepper system flowing? Came up with a few ideas. You know, I don't know if they're correct. All right. 
I'm listening. Number one, if it is a compressible fluid, um, the longer the pipe would create a higher NPSHA because the density at the inlet will be uh, higher than the density at the outlet. Hmm. I haven't heard that one before. That's interesting to consider. The density does fall. However, so does the pressure as well as the head loss. So I think your density fluctuation will be canceled out if not overtaken by the loss in pressure as well as the loss in essentially energy. What else you guys have? I need to come up with a system to have students being voluntold to respond in class. Stay tuned. Wouldn't you usually just raise the tank elevation um, so you can have a higher pressure going in? Yes, you can manipulate the static pressure in the system, definitely. Um, I like that idea. Instead of lifting the whole tank, what we can do instead is increase the fluid level within my tank. New storage tank, right? So that's just changing a set point. That increases the static pressure in the system. Any other ideas? We could also convince him that hot Dr. Pepper is gross we can decrease the fluid temperature. Doing that will decrease the vapor pressure that exists on the fluid. What other ideas do we have? Well, we can reduce the length of the suction line to minimize that head loss. And if possible, we could re either reduce our flow rate, which is usually not happening, you know, and vice versa, our velocity, or we could increase our pipe diameter, the diameter of the suction line. All right, so basically look at the terms that we have, pressure energy, kinetic energy, head loss, and our static head, Z sub A. Now, a couple things to note on, on that positive suction head. So in general, the U squared over two term is often considered negligible. And if you actually look in your book on page 204 where these equations are, you'll, you'll notice that it doesn't even write them in for the equations, and it just has a simple discussion underneath that says, yeah, it's technically a term, but the numbers are so small, we can typically neglect it. And another thing, because students have this issue, in, in the term that's negative ZA, it's negative if your pump is above the fluid level and it's positive if the pump is below the fluid level. Just kind of follow statics and don't just assume it's always negative. So that's where that asterisk ZA comes in. So important things to keep in mind. Why is it that way? Why? Yes. 
Uh, because it follows um, essentially fluid statics. So if I've got a tank, going back to you know that system that we just had, right? If this fluid is such that PA is equal to PV, because it's about T is equal to T boil, that's all well and good here at this vapor liquid interface. But if this is a, an appreciable height, the pressure at this inlet is going to be PA plus rho GH by fluid statics. And so a way to increase the pressure at the inlet is to just increase your level set point and increase the static pressure that exists due to the fluid pressing down upon itself. And that's, that's probably the easiest way um, to manipulate your net positive suction head available, provided you're not going to have an issue with having insufficient headspace, because the headspace is important, especially for, for fluids with appreciable face room stressor. So I will say that headspace is important. You want to have room for fluids to expand and contract and vapor do exist when necessary, right? If you don't, things can rupture and then you end up on a weird OSHA web video about an explosion rocked today. You don't want that. All right, so how much time we have? We have a little bit of time. So we're gonna jump into the next discussion, probably the big discussion for this chapter. And that's on characteristic curves. i.e. pump and system curves. So if you're going to pay attention to one thing in this chapter so that you do well on midterms, uh, let this one be it because this will probably be on the midterm two and or the final, but definitely on midterm two. So you guys want to start talking about pump curves or system curves for first? Take your pick. Let's do pumps. Let's do pumps. I like it. So pump curves. How about pump curves? So when we're talking about pumps and pump operations, we can say following the mechanical energy balance, if I write it in terms of fluid head, I can say P2 over rho G plus u2 squared over 2g plus z2 equals u1 squared over 2g plus z1 plus work over gravity. Hey, Dr. Right. Lopez, I think we lost you for a second. So we yeah, I think it kicked me out for like a very split second. Glitch in the matrix. We can look and see what changed. All right. So I have my two points in the system, right? So a comparison between two points in my system tells me... Hey, Dr. Lopez, we can't see anything. Oh, I forgot. I have to reshare the screen. Okay, so what we have, looking at our mechanical energy balance, right now I'm neglecting friction, and I can say the energy comparison between two points can be summed up using things in terms of, you know, fluid head. And what I can say is the head at a certain point versus the head at the initial point can be a direct factor of the work input into the system by a pump. Or I can say work over gravity is equal to a change in head, which is essentially H2 minus H1. And what that tells me is in general, pump can impart fluid head to a system typically categorized as pressure energy In general, we have a delta H is essentially the, the energy input to a system by a pump. 
now that energy that it inputs delta H is a function of a f the flow rate of the fluid. So I can say delta H is a direct function of the fluid flow rate. And that function typically takes the form of some value A minus another value B times the flow rate of the fluid squared. And so what we have is an inverse parabola. And so if I was going to graph the head added to our system delta H as a function of the fluid flow rate V dot, I would see the curve looking like this. And so this would be our pump curve. So this denotes the fluid head added by our pump. We can contrast this with considering a system curve. Now by the mechanical energy balance, the other stuff we can find that the head required, if you want, this is the, I can do an A and an R once again, added by the pump required by the system, follows a similar trend. However, it has some constant C plus another constant D times our volumetric flow rate squared. What this means, is that for a fluid system, the head required required for flow is directly related to the square of flow rate. of the flow rate. And so if I was going to graph delta H R on the same graph, I would have a minimum head required for flow, which is that C constant, and it would follow this curve. And this would be my system curve. Or this tells me or denotes the fluid head required for flow at a given flow rate. And what do we see but an intersection between these two, system, two curves. And so this is our point of intersection. which means for that given fluid system, if I put that pump in place, the system is gonna have that flow rate V not, and the head that's required and which will also be added to the system is denoted here, delta H, which I'll call delta H naught. With that in mind, I will keep you with one last question. What do we do when we want to operate outside of a single point? 
right? Because, you know, that's real well and good for that given system. I can put that pump on it. It's going to have X fat flow rate, V naught, as well as, you know, the head added and required, also denoted by the intersection. But I'd really like to have some flexibility in my flow system. So I want you guys to think about that between now and Thursday, and we'll continue this discussion at that time. Hopefully you guys will have some answers to that one. Any last minute questions, points of discussion, things you'd like to comment on? I'm more than happy to answer or, or have those discussions. If not, that's all I have for you guys today. So take care, have a great rest of your day. And if you need me, I'll be on office hours this morning. So feel free to jump in. And if not, I will see you all on Thursday. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. You're welcome, take care.